Lieutenant Colonel Darren Gobb is a, a co-founder of Restore Liberty and a frequent Newsmax contributor, among other things, uh, lives up in Montana. Uh, Colonel Gobb, thank you for coming on with us. Uh, can you give me a quick rundown? We all, we've only got about 10 or 15 minutes today, Max. So let's start with a quick rundown of your military background and how you got to Restore Liberty. Sure. Thanks, Chuck. And uh, I'm happy to be joining you here. But uh, yeah, my background is, uh, like you said, I'm a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, but I started out enlisted in the infantry and uh, went up to Washington, D.C., where I spent uh, three years in the Army's Honor Guard under Bush Sr. and, and Clinton's at the White House. And I learned a lot about uh, what corruption looks like and what evil looks like. So I went, got out, though, went back to college, was going to start a business, and that was not what I was called to do. So I ended up going into ROTC full scholarship, got graduated and commissioned into our aviation branch and flew Blackhawks and started out in South Korea. And then, you know, 22 years, seven deployments later, retired in August 1st of 2019 between uh, multiple levels of command, but also became a, a, a strategic planner for the Army and started building plans for countries at the same time. So uh, mm -hmm. it's a good mix of a background, I think, that got me to the point where I was ready to retire, be left alone, never leave the state of Montana, have a simple job and do nothing challenging and, and just recover from all the different kinds of wounds of war. That didn't last. So uh, that, it's completely <laughs> off topic, but what, what's your, having been a Blackhawk pilot, what's your reaction when you see the number of Blackhawks that we left in Afghanistan and what the Taliban are trying to do with them? Well, it's like any piece of equipment we left there. They're going to use it to their advantage for sure. It's a, uh, it's pretty sad, of course, the way we left that country. I mean, it helped write the plan for how to evacuate Afghanistan in a hurry. And, and it was like they took the plan and flipped it over and said, let's do everything wrong and opposite. And the results are obvious for all to see. But it, it I hate to see it. I know that they're not going to be able to maintain them to the, to the level they're supposed to be. They're going to eventually do what they do with all the kinds of you know high tech equipment they're going to they usually get in that country which is eventually it'll be parked on the side of a runway somewhere as a as a potted plant of a sort mm -hmm. uh, but uh we know that they're Did leaving you see the, the one the other day that went like nose in that they were flying it in a, some sort of demonstration or something at uh at bagram and the, and the thing just went woo it went straight in killed like six people yeah, I didn't, I didn't see that one, but uh, yeah. I'm not That surprised. was what I was thinking of, because I thought if you saw that, you'd have been like, oh, gosh. <laughs> well, yeah, there's there's a number of reasons for something why that could happen, from you know, aircraft power availability to system failure within that aircraft, and specifically that particular flight profile, uh -huh. just down to the, the people flying it. Even though, even though we did train the Afghan Air Force, which includes their helicopter side of things, uh, they didn't have enough time. It, it takes years to make a good aviator and i think it was probably a loose nut behind the cyclic but um and that would do it that's usually you know very that, good odds right <laughs> so uh all right that let's let's talk about ukraine there's obviously been a lot of developments uh mm -hmm. we, we've been following very closely uh you and me both uh tell me your thoughts about uh, this current mobilization scheme and what uh, we might expect from the russians out of that well, being a historian, the first thing that popped into my mind was typical Russia. You know, we don't do tactics. We do volume and we don't care about human life. So what we're going to do is we're just going to line everybody up and we're going to run at you. And we're just going to keep running at you until we run out of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's very much a Russia thing. However, the, one of the dis differences is, of course, Ukraine is, as you know, uh, been trained by us for many years. Not all of them, of course, but a good number of them in their leadership. So they have a sense of at least Western style tactics and some, some of the ideas that we ingrained in them. And then they combine it with their own natural willpower they have and you know dislike for the Russian Empire. And, and you've got yourself a, an interesting mix, to say the least. That mobilization, though, is is telling in how much it, it, it I guess you could say it tells us that uh, it's an admission by Russia that things are not going as well as they might be claiming. And it's going to become very obvious to people inside Russia who may not have known it before or were being lied to by their own government, which you know may shock you that a government would lie to its own people. What? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I was reading something actually just now that was saying they believe 
he massively understated the volume of people that will be mobilized. And when you look at the number of videos coming out of mobilization centers all around uh, all around Russia, I think that's true. Uh, they're saying that the to true number of people they'll mobilize is somewhere around 1.2 million. And that means that a whole lot more mothers are going to watch their sons go off to war. But do they really have the wherewithal uh, to A, train these guys and B, equip these guys and send them in there with anything other than just, you know, like World War II era weapons. Well, and this kind of goes back to for the last, I guess, 20 years or so, I've been telling people, even senior leaders in the military, that the Russian military is is a, is a paper tiger in some ways, not in all, but uh, it is not as good as we make it out to be. And if, if they didn't have cyber nuclear and, and such you know, national capabilities. They're just a typical Eastern European military. And, and now you got two of them going head to head. Uh, I do not believe the 300,000 number is at all the final number. I agree with you. It's going to, it's going to be a lot more, especially since they've got, a, you know, out of 1.2 million of them, how many of them are going to be the right kind of people to fight in the first place? We have the same challenge any nation does with quality of their people. Uh, we see people escaping to Georgia, as we talked about with someone before. Because um, they don't want to be conscripted into this. They don't want to be part of this. Uh, they don't see a gain to it uh, if we narrow it down to just Russia, Ukraine. And another thing that a lot of people really aren't talking about is Russia was on a steep decline population wise for many years before this conflict even happened. And if you really start throwing their youth into a buzzsaw of a war, whether it be Ukraine or, get, or if it grows bigger, which we hope it doesn't, of course. Now, that population decline is just going to continue and accelerate. You know, in the long term, that's a pretty big deal. So let me let, let's talk about something a little more philosophical that I, I think is probably the most difficult question that I've struggled with out of this conflict, and that is a, when you look at the the people who are supporting the conflict in the United States, it seems completely backwards. Uh, you would think typically Republicans tend to be more hawkish. Uh, typically, they tend to be more focused on foreign policy, and they tend to do a much better job with foreign policy than, than Democrats do. Um, why, why is it then that in this particular conflict, I tend to be on the side of, God forbid, Nancy Pelosi, uh, and, you know, Ursula von Leyen and people who I absolutely despise for every other reason. But yet, when it comes to this conflict, they're the ones calling for us to support Ukraine, while many Republicans are saying, ah, just let them, you know, it, this is the Middle East for white people, let them fight among themselves. Yeah, and it's it's tough because anytime looking back on history, it's easy to judge. You know, look at the history leading up to World War II and Hitler's actions and how he grew and expanded. And any point in time, we can look back and say, you know, at this point, someone should have intervened, or at this point, or or whatever. But now we're now we're living it and trying to project forward and guess what is coming, uh, which is virtually impossible. So, with our organization, with Restore Liberty, with uh, my co-founder and I, Blaine Holt, who's frequently, of course, on Newsmax. Uh, uh, we're really saying that who's corrupt, the U.S., the Ukraine, or Russia? Well, at the governmental level, all three of them are and have been for a very long time. And so we're not going to paint a hero out of any of the national leaders. Um, but we stand with the populations that tend to suffer with what we call the global Game of Thrones. It's, there's no doubt in our minds that the people who live in, frankly, Russia, Ukraine, Poland, and all of these border states that are, that are Moldova, uh, for example, shouldn't be suffering because of this global game it's in its currencies, it's actual warfare, it's energy. There's a lot of different parts to this conflict. Uh, why in the U.S. is it, does it seem to be flipped? Uh, I think there's a sympathetic part of the Democratic left that's always there regardless. Uh, in this particular case, they painted Putin to be this nasty, evil monster, which is easy to do. And made Zelensky the hero, which, yeah, you know, that takes a little bit of work, though. Um, but the Biden history with Ukraine has to be part of this. And I'm sure the Republicans are, if you're just going to paint a big brush with them and just say, hey, they're probably saying that uh, Ukraine is the uh, the central bank of the Bidens. 
And no matter what goes on there, we don't want to get involved. And I do believe there needs to be a full accounting for every dime spent and every piece of equipment spent that is coming out of our frontline forces and reducing our readiness. Right. But I'm not, I'm, I've been on the front lines in Ukraine, and I've, uh, that's one thing that I've paid very close attention to and have asked a lot. You know, is the stuff that we're sending getting to you guys on the front lines? And they say, absolutely, it is. Um, that, you know, it's not going out the back door and being sold off to some other country. Although when this is over, whatever's left, just that may very well happen to, uh, very likely will happen to. Uh, I, I tend to agree with you. I think that whenever you have to make a calculus about who to support in an, in a, in an event like this, you, you have to start with the moral uh, question and say, who, who's in the right here? And well, Ukraine's not in the wrong. They didn't attack anybody. Uh, but they, there's a lot of propaganda out there that says they were attacking people in the Donetsk. But I was down in the Donetsk right before the war started and was listening to Russian propaganda say they, you know, the, the Ukrainians bombed here, here, and here today. And I had been in two of those three places and the Ukrainians were not bombing. I was with the guys that would have been doing the bombing and they weren't bombing. So, so I know that the vast majority of that propaganda is false. Uh, and there, there wasn't any real reason for the Ukrainians to be bombing the civilians of Donetsk then or now. Uh, so, so I think from a moral standpoint, it's fairly easy to make the determination that um, Ukraine is on the right side of this. From an economic and, and uh, national security standpoint, I think that there's a case to be made either way. We are spending a tremendous amount of money we don't have right now. Uh, not all that we say is going to Ukraine is actually going to Ukraine. A lot of it's getting circled right back around to the Pentagon, which is then going to Boeing and stuff like that. Of course. Uh, and uh, I guess, you know, it's, it's frustrating because I feel like um, if I make my decision for, who, you know, who to support in this based on the moral component first, and I end up on the same side as Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden, I feel like I, either I'm wrong or they're doing the right thing for the wrong reason somehow. And I think maybe that is the case. Like you say, uh, you know, Bar uh, Barack Obama supported Ukraine or, or did not really support Ukraine when Russia invaded in 2014. And that was really before, um, you know, all, all of this Joe Biden stuff came out about the you know, the money and Hunter Biden and, and everything like that. From what I can tell, Zelensky, um, it, when you read the things that that have been dug up about him uh, from a, a, a corruption standpoint, they're fairly, I, I would say they're fairly benign. I mean, they're, they're like, oh, he has offshore accounts and he has, uh, you know, companies in the Azores. Well, I've got offshore accounts. I mean, if you were to to write a report based on my financial dealings, which are as not certainly not, I'm, I'm not trying to be corrupt with my financial dealings. I try very hard not to be. But if you were to write a report from the standpoint of we're looking for something, you know, to to make it sound corrupt, you could make my finances sound pretty corrupt just because I live outside the United States, and people people do that sometimes. So all I'm saying is, um, I, and I said this before, I think Ukrainians are not so concerned about becoming globalists as they are about concerning with staying Ukrainian. The yeah. Ukrainians want to be Ukrainian. And Zelensky is doing a very good job of leading the Ukrainians uh, into maintaining their sovereignty as a, as a state. Now, if he has to cozy up to a bunch of globalists in order to get the funding he needs to do that, then it looks like he's willing to do that. And I, who could blame him? He's doing what he has to do. I don't. I, I've I've met him a couple times. I've met all the people around him, and I've interviewed them several times. I don't get the sense that these people are flaming liberal globalists. They really aren't. They're just patriotic Ukrainians. They just care about Ukraine. And so, anyway, it's just it's still confusing to me. It's just sort of you know a conundrum that I'm you know I I, I wonder ten years from now how we're going to feel about this. But uh, so my my question then to you is. Where where does where are we going to be with this thing a year from now, two years from now, five years from now? Do you, do you really think we will see Russia collapse? And if they do, how does that look? What does Russia do? do if we back Putin into a corner, do you think he's crazy enough to drop a nuke someplace? 
Well, uh, it, one of the hardest things to do in the world is to assess other people's motivations, right? And, and their and their willpower ahead of, ahead of the, uh, I guess, of whatever events are going to occur. Um, I, I mean, Russia's been through a lot. They haven't collapsed from things in the past. I don't necessarily see them collapsing now. They've done a pretty good job of planning ahead for this when it comes to their currency plans or gold standards uh, and various other things. And they're also willing to certainly let their people suffer a whole lot more than it seems like we're willing to suffer here in America for, um, for, for lack of a better term, uh, Mother Russia or the motherland. Yeah. Uh, there, there's just a certain cultural aspect of that. Uh, and, and, you know, I've been all over Eastern Europe and had task forces and people I commanded in multiple countries. You get to learn about the countries, not only militarily, but uh, all, all aspects of their government, their economics and various things. And, and there's a uh, there's a level of what we would call you know, corruption uh, that varies in each one of those countries. But what we see over here is becoming more like what they're just used to in East Europe uh, because of where they come from. And you, you can paint the picture good, bad, or indifferent on that. But uh, mm -hmm. I think in a couple of years from now, I, there is going to be a, boot, a bruise in battered Russia. I do think you'll probably have a new leader there sooner than later. His health is failing quickly as we as we know, it's just a matter of where that goes from here. Um, and there's a lot of challenges that have been leveled against NATO to either grow, uh, to assume what is a NATO problem, what is not a NATO problem, because whether Ukraine's in NATO or not, it's now a NATO problem anyways, uh, whether they like it or not. And of course, the U.S. is part of NATO. So we did have some sort of responsibility to get involved because of the NATO aspect, I guess. Um, what, what do you know about Finland's military? I did a, I just finished a story today about uh, Finland's military, and I was surprised to learn how well regarded they are uh, for being such a tiny country among NATO uh, troops, even though they, they're not actually part of NATO. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing I've learned is never underestimate the Finns, no matter what they have, whether it be a little or a lot. Uh, they know where they live. They know their history better than anybody. And they know what Russia's aggression looks like over the years. And, you, you know, you look back as far as uh, the Russian Revolution and what happened in World War II. Uh, the Finns always gave the Russians a run for their money, no matter what was going on around them or how little they had, regardless of the temperatures and the, uh, the different parts of the climate. So I think uh, there should be some legitimate concern about Sweden and Finland joining into NATO if all of that plays out fully. But uh, we shouldn't necessarily look at it from the simple perspective that they're incapable of taking care of themselves to some extent. I mean, look at the uh, the, the Saab. Saab makes some of their fighter jets and other equipment. It's some great machinery. Now, the Finns have a willpower unlike any others. I mean, they're, they're a small version of Ukraine when it comes to willpower and just knowing how much they despise the Russians. And that makes up a lot of difference in the difference between manpower, uh, machinery, as if you don't have the will to win, it doesn't matter what you have. Right. <laughs> well, uh, so explain to me uh, your organization, what they do, and and what you're all about. Okay. Yeah, we're uh, our organization's called Restore Liberty. You can see the poster over my shoulder here. And we're at restore-liberty.org. And what we do is talk about building this nation back from the ground up and because the swamp is just what the swamp is at this point and the only way to truly influence that is to build it from the bottom up instead of the the left that fails upwards we need to promote on merit and we like to endorse and support candidates for things like sheriff and judges and clerks and recorders and school boards and then move up from there and watch them get promoted through their merit you know, assuming that getting moved up into a national level office is considered a promotion uh, it may not be, but uh, local politics makes all the difference in the country that is bounded by the fact that the states are the primary political, political entity here. So that's where we want to be. Uh, we want to counter the Soros narrative and methods across the country and build that capability over time. It's not going to happen immediately. So uh, that's what, uh, where Blaine Holt and I think we can come together and provide some leadership from our almost 60 years of military time put together. And, and put and do that. And our structure is national executive team, state directors, uh, and a variety of things within those states that we build out based on that state director. And you can imagine what those are from PR to financing to marketing and you name it, it's all there. Sure. Uh, but we sure. will not, we're tired of the uh, you know elephant versus donkey game, you know the party politics and all this kind of stuff. We wanna be Americans. We wanna 
get the right people into office. We We want to win through peaceful actions and legislation and leadership and just be part of the solution among many organizations that we hope we're all working towards the same. Now, the rest of it's on our website. There's a lot there to see. And as you know, uh, we, we do get on Newsmax occasionally and, and bring our national and global strategic outlook, which is Blaine's and my sort of a hobby, I guess you could say and uh, bring some of that reality into the people's living rooms and talk about how places like Ukraine and energy crisis in Europe and various things impact your bottom line, your family's capability of, of living the life you want to live free in this country, you know, in, in your communities. That's really good. That's really good. Uh, so how can people get a hold of you and, and find out more about it? Yeah, yeah, hit the website at uh, restore-liberty.org. Take a look at our uh, consent declaration there. That's that's pretty neat. It's educational. And you can send an email to just patriots at restore-liberty.org. And that's our general inbox. And, and that's how we get in touch with people. We'll, sh we'll ship them out to a state director and let it go from there. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Colonel. And I appreciate your, your sentiments on the war and everything. Uh, and thanks for your help with the atrocity series, the award-winning atrocity series. I don't know if you heard that uh, Greta uh, Van Susteren was awarded a Legion of Merit or something from the yeah. president of uh, Ukraine because of the atrocity series that we worked on. Uh, and you were part of that. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> oh, I didn't know I was, but happy to hear it and more than happy to be on the uh, the side of right here. Like you said, take the moral high ground and stay there. That's right. Absolutely. Well, God bless you and uh, keep up the good work. You too. Thanks, Chuck. Okay.